Hello guys and welcome to today's episode of The Wolf Digest. I am Amaros Dannon. I am the co-host Turkanel. And today's news bits include some leaked information about the 2060, uh, some fun uh, tech overview that we were looking at from Polyphony Digital, some news about The Witcher coming up on Netflix, and a little side note we have found as well. Uh, the big one we'll be hitting on is regarding Centrelink, if you haven't heard that. Well, it's going to be all kinds of fun. Well, and then we added a couple of you know, tidbits that we're looking forward to come CES. Yeah, I, I think we're all excited for CES. I, I actually don't know a whole lot of what's going to be announced. I know that there's some big key game companies that are making some keynotes, but also some good hardware manufacturers as well. So definitely waiting with bated breath on that one. And I'm really looking forward to see what, you know, the, what kind of truths we'll actually get out of AMD concerning some of the leaked information we've seen. So, yeah. <laughs> well, let's start with NVIDIA first though. The 2060, apparently uh, there's two rumors out there. Uh, one is that a GTX 1160 is gonna land with obviously missing the RT features, the RT core and stuff, so it won't have the ray tracing. But there's also uh, leaks out there that the 1160 is a laptop chip. And I'm wondering if maybe the whole 1160 stuff is actually just laptop components as opposed to desktop components. But well, of course- it's certainly possible considering the fact if you look at back at the 800 series, yeah. that it, that was a laptop only uh, uh, chip. Yeah. I should know. I've got one. <laughs> but with the 10 series, they actually started naming the laptop chip and the desktop chip the same. A 1070 is a 1070. You just have to put the word mobile in front of it to know what you're talking about, right? And the performance level is actually different as well. It's not a 1070 performance in a laptop, which is kind of the misleading thing, in my opinion. I, I really liked the differing uh, the differentiating of the models so that they would be a little easier to Google. But if you're looking up a mobile 1070 performance and you just Google or NVIDIA 1070, you're going to get way different performance levels than what you're actually getting in your laptop. Yeah, you have to hunt them a little bit differently to get that. Yeah, but NVIDIA is no stranger to misleading marketing. I mean, just look at the 1060 <laughs> for Pete's sake. I mean, 1066 gig or 1063 gig? Well, let's get the 3 gig. It's so much cheaper. Look at this. Oh, we didn't mention that it's missing some CUDA cores? Sorry. Mm, oh, well. Yeah, I know. But if we go to what we actually have we're, that we're staying at here, the 2060. So from the information that we've been able to come across so far, this thing is going to land its performance marks neighborhood of the current 1070 Ti on an average level. Yes. I mean, it'll be slightly above in some cases, slightly below in some cases. I mean, you look at 1080p performance, you got the division where it's actually 81 versus 89 frames or... Uh, AOTS, you know, where it's 55 instead of 60, you know, it, those are kind of uh, the, the downers. You get some positives where Battlefield, you actually gain some performance and it has the ray tracing that you just don't get with the previous gens. And you get other games where it has significant gains, like phenomenal gains over what the old one would do. Like you look at VR Mark and it's way up there, 222. And you got Wolfenstein 2, which is 138 as opposed to the 116 or even the 121 that the 1080 gave. I mean, that's a significant performance jump. And it makes me wonder if the optimizations they did for the 2060 just weren't backported to the 1080 or the 10 series at all. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's really hard to see what exactly is actually pulling off unless there's somehow something in there that's just making it easy, but you know, it's probably driver related. Yeah, and I mean, NVIDIA, they have been known to not backport some of their optimizations to their older generation cards. And 
it, I mean, they even get some flack for it. I mean, even at some un, uncalled for exaggeration in some cases, but I've seen benchmarks where they get a performance bump with current gen, but last gen they don't. And it's entirely up to the driver optimization. You can just tell that they didn't optimize the older generation of cards. And what we're looking at, at least when it comes to the uh, raw specs, is it's literally about half the, like what they call the ray tracing cores of actually less than half of the 2080 Ti, mm -hmm. uh, a little above half as compared to the 2080. And it's less than half the CUDA cores. But if you compare it to like a 1080, so the thing that's supposedly beating over there, we're sitting at about, what is that, about 70% the CUDA cores. So the uh, stock 2080, if you just look on you know, NVIDIA's website, says 2050 or 2560 CUDA cores compared to the 1920 that we see in this leak. Mm -hmm. So we, a little bit of you know, processing difference there. Yeah, um, so there's definitely some IPC gains or some concurrency benefits to this a new series of cards over the 10 series for sure. The thing I'm really saying that's helping it, um, according to the leak, the memory clock is at 14 gigabit, whereas in the 10, old 1080, it was 10. Yeah, which suggests that the NVIDIA cards might actually have a memory bandwidth or a memory throughput limitation. And they had to up that for these new cards, considering they're getting GDDR6, then... Yeah, you know, that's obviously going to help. I mean, you look at what AMD tried to do to gain some performance. They went with HBM, high bandwidth memory, to eliminate the memory bandwidth as a limiter of their GPUs. And so they were really running full out, trying to get some performance back. And, you know, they still fell short of NVIDIA because NVIDIA just has the superior gaming card right now especially for dx11 yep the thing that has been noticed though is that with dx12 you actually lose a, a smidgen you know just a few fps but you, you lose a smidgen of performance going from dx11 to dx12 and why that is who knows maybe it's just their drivers are better optimized for direct x11 but it does happen whereas with amd it's kind of the reverse their drivers are so weak with DirectX 11 that they actually get a performance gain by going to 12. And it probably helps that they don't stress the CPU as much as they did with 11. So there is that too. Yeah, so it's going to be interesting to see at least how it ends up playing out once you know they actually land in the market. Yeah, and I think this is going to make at least having a little bit of RTX available to the masses because 2060 is going to be kind of at that upper mid tier you know, where most of your enthusiast gamers are probably going to land getting a 2060. I'm not talking the enthusiast gamers that are, you know, deep pockets, the ones that can afford a $1,200 video card. I'm talking, you know, the, the tweens, the teens that are getting Christmas presents, that kind of stuff you know, where they'll get it. 2060. Um, one thing to note, though, is there has been a leak coming out of Gigabyte where they actually registered with the EEC, that's the Eurasian Economic Commission, kind of a listing for products that are sold by companies. They leaked, what, 40 <laughs> different 2060 cards with their various... What? Yeah, 40 different cards with their various naming schemes. You know, WinForce, 2X, 3X, Mini, Aorus, Gaming, whole long list. And the important part is that there is 6 gig, 4 gig, and 3 gig variants. Oh, boy. Yeah, 4 gig is a little weird of a size. We haven't seen that yet with the... 10 series, but 
we're not quite sure what that's going to do for the memory bus bandwidth. It might be a higher bandwidth or a lower. I don't know. But it's definitely going to be an interesting tier. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say it's probably going to be similar to the 3 gig in performance. But with that little extra RAM to help differentiate. Who knows? Maybe it's a Eurozone Air or something only card. We'll see. Yeah, wait and find out. Yeah, but let's let's also wait and find out to see if they do the same CUDA core neutering that they did with the twenty, <laughs> the ten sixty three gig versus the six. Yeah. That that's also something that I really hope every review of these cards emphasize explicitly. If they do something like that and there is a performance difference, they need to spell that out. But at mm-hmm. least they're releasing them both at the same time rather than staggering it and then trying to sneak in that 3 gig as an equivalent card, which it wasn't. And also it's going to be interesting to see, you know, once we get more ray tracing games available from that, how it's going to turn out. Oh, yeah. However... We could also go and look at what's happening in the software aspect as something that came out of SIGGRAPH last year, uh, or rather this year since it's still 2018. Yeah, SIGGRAPH 2018. <laughs> so uh, you've heard of Gran Turismo, right? Oh, yeah. I actually really like the game. So the developer, Polyphony Digital, um they have pulled off apparently ray tracing with software. Yeah. (laughs) I would be interested to know what method they're using. I mean, you got two big forms of ray tracing. You got path tracing, which is from the camera to an endpoint after X number of refractions, or you got a light source to the camera ray tracing and that is a very computationally intensive, but that's the method that is used in a lot of CGI animation stuff. And it gives a really realistic effect. But I kind of like the path tracing idea a little better. You get a very true uh, result from that one too, and it's a little bit more performant, I would assume, because you're not refracting all over in sundry to places that would never hit the camera. And and from what you've seen, the demo that was played at SIGGRAPH, and you can actually find videos of that, um, such as the article we have linked for this one, um, you can actually see how it actually looks in the game. That's all software-based. And the information that we've been, it shows in the article is that this is being targeted for the potentially next PlayStation system. Yeah. So if that's the case, like PS4 right now is running AMD, and if the PS5 runs AMD, well, it's going to be interesting. Yeah, because you're not going to be able to get this uh, ray tracing in a console for years if that's the case. AMD or a software form is going to have to come to light to actually manage to do this ray tracing stuff and have to do it seamlessly to where it may be able to run the same uh, code structure as what is being done for the RTX. Um, I'm playing the video right now and you can see in the paint reflection, the sun, the refractions of the light from the sun, you got chrome here and you can see a building kind of being uh, shown or driving past a pole right there. You can see trees and stuff along oh and here's one with chrome reflecting you can see it's affecting the color of the chrome and then reflecting back off of the paint job i mean there there's a lot of uh, show that it's at least two hops if they're doing something like path tracing which is what i would try to do if i was trying to be optimizing through software i would do like path tracing with two maybe three bounces and then cut it at that but obviously you'd have to take into account light sources. So there might be some fudging that you have to do in there. 
Um, they did admit that their latest Gran Turismo Sport actually has ray tracing in it, but they had to fudge it a little bit. They actually did some pre-rendered ray tracing on the vehicles um, so that they don't have to use as much compute to actually do it, which suggests that this is probably somewhat compute intensive. They don't tell us what the spec of the machine is that they're using to show off these demos. They just tell us that it's all being done in real time and you have frame counts and stuff in the bottom left that we don't really see a whole lot of title for. So it could be anything, who knows? But you can see it makes those shadows look really nice, especially on that last shot there where the car is just parked. You can see the shadows fade. Got a little bit of reflection right here and up next to the vehicle. And you can see the reflection of the shadow on the vehicle itself. So the, the whole ray tracing stuff definitely adds a wonderful component to the fidelity of the image. And it's just really beautiful. I don't know a better way to say it. Well, it's certainly something to look forward to either way, especially if it's if it does end up playing out on, you know, that well, especially on like an AMD card, then maybe we can see that technology move out beyond, you know, the Gran Turismo series. If we can, then that could get really interesting out in the wild. Yeah, exactly. And as far as Polyphony has said, they're just still exploring the possibilities, you know, in quotes. <laughs> and Honestly, I'd like to see it included in the next PlayStation, the next Xbox, as a software method of rendering these rays, just to even give some kind of semblance to what NVIDIA is doing. Well, either way, that's all going to be quite a ways out, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. But something that is coming sooner, The Witcher. <laughs> I know I'm anticipating The Witcher coming out on Netflix. This is going to be a pretty good series from what I can tell. And I hope it's a series rather than just a season. Well, it sounded like it was going to be a series because it's you know listed as... Actually, I, th I think I've already heard it as seasons. So therefore, it's going to be a series. It may just be a mini series. We don't know. Well, but we do kind of know there was a leak and that leak was that the what um yeah let's see the editor-in-chief ac walsh recently revealed that netflix is very happy with the witcher series and it seems like the series may be renewed for multiple seasons before the first one even airs so we potentially could get at least two seasons out of this yeah it's practically all but confirmed that they're uh renewing for a second season and we don't even have the first in our hands to give a rating to say it's a yay or nay anyway but I mean, when you got somebody that's doing a you know, game of thrones daredevil walking dead colony you know, all these directors are collaborating on this Witcher Netflix series, you know it's going to be good. So definitely something worthwhile to look forward to if you're a fan of The Witcher. Yeah. But you know how rumors go, right? <laughs> yeah, everything's always a wait and find out. Yeah. I mean, there was rumor that Zelda was going to come out on Netflix, right? You remember that? They're like, wait till November 11th for the announcement. And everyone was Still speculating waiting. that it was... Well, no, we're not. The The Devil May Cry, the animated series coming to Netflix, that's what they were announcing on the 11th that they hinted at. It wasn't Zelda like everyone was speculating or hoping, oh. I would say. It was Devil May Cry, which I would like to see Zelda, but Devil May Cry is a pretty good second runner-up. You know? I Have you seen Castlevania? On Netflix. I have unfortunately not watched it yet. I need to go in and check it out. I that's a superb series. It was kind of you know uh, underrated for a little while until they came out with the second season, and then it just took off. Everyone was like, "Oh my gosh, this is even better than the first season." 
and so I it's would definitely recommend that way. checking it out. But and even on for Castlevania, they're apparently going to get a third season on that. Yeah, because it it's such a breakaway success. I mean, Netflix just wasn't expecting it to take off like it did. And I'm really hoping that The Witcher follows in the same footsteps. I mean, the first season is going to be some world building, so it's going to be a little slow. We all know, you know, first installment of something is going to be slow. The first episode is world building, trying to get you hooked. But once a series hits the ground and runs, there's no more world building per se. It's just filling in the minor cracks and it just runs with the story and everything flows and it it works out really well so definitely a lot of fun series coming from games and at the same time i'm still gonna sit here with my fingers crossed and hope they don't <laughs> f it up we'll go with that because well, we know about the how things go with video games turn anything well excuse me princess <laughs> <laughs> the best line out of the old series i know right it was There's a little a cheesy lot animation it. but it was back in the day when mario brothers was animated and all these and other that was games yeah and that was cheesy too but they were targeted towards kids because they they targeted like what eight to ten year olds for nintendo stuff so yeah what do you expect <laughs> well definitely a lot of stuff we can look forward to there and we can we'll we'll be checking it out once it hits. Oh yeah, definitely. Maybe even reviewing it. That would be a fun <laughs> one. Yeah, probably good. But going on to something that affected us a little not directly. Because we're not stupid <laughs> enough to have Century Link. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we did have a couple of we found out a couple of our wild guild mates did have their internet go out because of this reason. Mm -hmm. So Century Link Thursday. A lot of the Western U.S. and some other, you know, areas completely went out. Yeah, from like 3.50 a.m. Eastern time. And we're gone for about the next 24 plus hours. Yeah. So we know that it was into Friday, I think evening, before some people even got their regular internet back. And there was still, ling I think there's still lingering issues right now. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it was such a widespread outage that affected so much of the Pacific Northwest and even the Midwest and such that the FCC actually did something for once and launched an investigation into what caused the outage. But part of that came from the fact that it knocked out 911 call centers. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's actually the catalyst of what caused the FCC to jump in. They're like restoring critical 911 capabilities. You know, the outage was unacceptable. And especially the delays in actually getting services restored. And so he's directing public safety staff to launch an investigation. So that's, I mean, that's a big thing in losing 911 services. Yeah, but to be fair, you know, I admin for a hospital clinic kind of environment. And I mean, we had a single link, but we also stored our medical records in house. It, we did our electronic medical records on site. We didn't rely on a cloud hosted service or anything like that. So we could afford to have an outage because we would still have access to the data. But yeah, we know from the least. We know of at least one hospital, and one, there was a, or one of the articles we found, there was a Colorado uh, medical center that lost access uh, intermittently, apparently, to be able to access their records. Which suggests that they're being cloud-hosted. And honestly, if I was a, a clinic, let alone a hospital, if my medical records were hosted off-site, I would ensure that I could reach that off-site location. <sighs> Um, a redundant internet connection, even if it was crap, would be a necessity in my administrative plan. I mean, we had our stuff on site, but we still had in our DR scenario a method of getting to the internet 
in the event that we lost our primary internet connection. And this was merely to manage uh, credit card transactions and um, get uh, electronic uh, prescriptions submitted. And just makes you wonder, you know, for because that had to have been the host in that particular instance that went down. So it's a question of, or it was a question then of, is it something in, you know, in between? Yeah, and their ability to get from, you know, the actual data transfer from the facility to the host, or was it actually the host? Well, if the host went down, that's also a scary thought because if you're a cloud hosting service, if you're um, running a data center that relies on your internet connection, you have a redundant connection. And if you don't, you have a colo, some other data center that can manage the overflow if you're that big. If you're not, that throws into another question altogether. Um, but it sounds like the hospital was the one that had CenturyLink as their primary internet connection and they either didn't have a failover ISP or it wasn't successful in failing over to it. And I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and assume it wasn't able to be failed over to very effectively. Hence the intermittent service. Yeah, so we're gonna have to, I don't I really don't know what that one was uh, or using or which way it was, but hard to say. Yeah. But it's I, I do know that was that, a large outage. It's yeah. still surprising. I do know though that a lot of um, like SIP providers uh, they request dedicated T1 or DSL connections uh, to their data centers in order to provide you with a high QoS SIP service because they work with providers like CenturyLink to QoS that SIP traffic. And I've had a a SIP provider and been in that situation before. And so we actually did get a DSL connection to give us prioritized QoS SIP traffic for our SIP trunks. So I could see that being a very big problem too. All your phone lines dying. <laughs> we also did have the fallback of just running those SIP trunks over our actual internet service rather than the dedicated DSL line in order to still get service in the event of an outage. And thankfully we never had to do that, but it still was in our DR plan. And I would hope that some, other, some of these people had a similar DR plan in line. The, the big victims though, in my opinion, are all the SMBs all the small businesses that either couldn't afford some of these DR plans or just can't afford to write them in the first place because they don't have a dedicated IT staff. Yeah, and so I know at least from my, you know, uh, what I've had actually dealt with, some of those really small ones like, you know, for example, like a physical therapy office or you know, such, if they're lucky, they'll have, you know, an IT guy that will come in as needed. Yeah. And, and they're relying on whatever that person suggests as their, you know, uh, connections. So, yeah. And, and you're going to see, like, you know, maybe one server, maybe the one inner connection or, you know, one good inner connection. <laughs> <laughs> well, you definitely know. only one. It, it would be almost nonsensical to have two internet service connections for the, uh, rare to unlikely event that your primary one goes down for hours during business time. And most of the time they schedule maintenance for off hours, so it wouldn't impact your primary business. But in the office, I know like my case, the office I work with, we just have the one and so far we've never had any, okay, we only once had a major issue during business hours and it was resolved relatively quickly. Yeah. And, I think also the other problem is that a lot of uh, small businesses, if they have a dedicated IT guy, like I'm not talking the accountant turned IT guy, I'm talking an actual <laughs> IT guy, they should consider themselves lucky. I mean, that person almost needs to be showered with 
bonuses or something just to keep him on staff if he's good that is because finding a jack of all trades it guy that can just step in and handle pretty much anything that plugs into a wall is it's kind of rare these days you see a lot of it staff having to become hyper specialized in order to be able to uh, perform a duty uh, well you see a lot of pop up of uh, bringing in outside contractors and vars essentially these value added resellers to do professional service work in order to stand up different things like your firewall or a given server function or something like that just because in order to do IT, you can't really learn everything there is to know about everything. It's really difficult. And you can become cursory in a lot of things, especially things that you do on a day to day basis. But expecting you to be able to just roll out a SIM or a intrusion prevention or detection service at all, it if you're not a cybersecurity analyst or something, it, you might not be able to pull it off in the slightest. I'd have to get help. <laughs> yeah, I'd have to get help. And I actually manage cybersecurity at my work in some <laughs> cases, but I don't claim to be an expert. You know, I am cursory, and that's about what I can claim. I can talk with the professional services provide them with the information they need, but I'm not a cybersecurity personals, professional service provider, you know? Yeah. I only can do the rudimentary stuff, your basics, the things that lock you down well enough. And if you need more than that, well, you're probably bigger and able to afford an actual cybersecurity team. And I can keep up with some of the more general basics, or in a few cases, I can go a little more, a little bit more advanced. But yeah, keeping even on a jack of all trades scale, they're doing anything that you know can cover enough. You actually know what you're talking about, at least to some extent, is a very time-consuming process, and you're constantly learning. Yeah, tell me about it. I, I'm attempting to be one of those types of people. And fortunately, I seem to be doing a, a decent job. But, you know, I'm fallible. If you guys pick out anything that I'm wrong with, by all means, throw a comment. I like to learn, and I like to be corrected if I say something incorrect. Of course, if it's a bias thing, we all have biases, right? Don't throw your biases at me thinking that you're correct, too. Because we'll talk about it. <laughs> we'll we'll pull up statistics, data, and really get down in the nitty gritty. And I'm sure somewhere in there we'll both find out that we're both biased and we both had the wrong opinion in one way or another. I don't know. But that's the stuff I like. I like to get in and actually learn facts and present those facts. That's why when it comes to anything, especially to do with, you know, AMD versus Intel versus NVIDIA or anywhere in that mix we kind of don't care yeah. because I know you had a fair, you were fairly biased on AMD video cards, you know, for a while, whereas I've been when they were performing. More biased. Yeah. When I, and I was a bit more biased on NVIDIA mm -hmm. and I've been more, you know, especially of late more, or at least up until more recent times biased toward Intel and you were holding out on AMD. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've been running <laughs> Intel since core two. I, bought a core two at launch because I knew based on the actual specs and performance and uh, all the facts that it would be better than the AMD equivalent at the price point. And so I bought an Intel and I've been on Intel until Ryzen came out and I was actually holding out for Ryzen and it did not disappoint. <laughs> I got world's better performance at a lower price point than I would have got from an Intel. And it's still the case to this day. You can get a better performing all around 
I'm not talking just game FPS here. I'm talking an all-around system performance uplift by getting an AMD at a given price point. And there might be some you know, certain fringe price points where that's not true, but at least in the price points I look at, it's true. I got a better performing CPU out of it, and I'm, I'm glad. It was kind of a risk. But once the Ryzen's came out and the performance was there, it was a no-brainer. I'm glad. At least that for me, I was using a Gen One Core i7 when that thing hit. Yeah, I was at I least used... on an Ivy Bridge, and my wife yeah. had a Haswell. I was using this i7 here for like eight years. Yeah, nine years. I was suffering, and my my Ivy Bridge was delitted and overclocked to nobody's business, and I was still suffering. And when I upgraded to the Ryzen, I got literally double performance. My premiere renders took half the time. And I checked, I even re-rendered something I had rendered on my Ivy in half the time, just straight out of the gate on a stock 1700X. That was, that was the cool part. I actually had that overclocked Ivy versus a stock 1700X. Yeah. And they still had the memory issues at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so I was running like 2666 instead of the later 2933. And now I'm finally at the 3200 and have been for almost a year now. But, you know, Ryzen had some teething issues and they worked through it. It's been a while of getting there. And I mean, we will jump as we see fit, whatever, you know, fits our best for our performance. and price yeah. needs i mean and there's gpus we're also using in uh you know nvidia right now so yeah we are it, because our performance level is higher than what amd offers <laughs> you know still that that's part of the problem is we need that we want actually we don't need but we want that performance level that is higher than what amd has to offer at the moment if i was shooting at something like a 1060 1050 ti kind of range then it would be a pretty hard fight between that and a 570 580 because of that price point it's a pretty close match and you'd have to do some tweaking which i feel comfortable with but you might be able to make one or the other outperform just based on a little bit of memory clock tweaking or a little bit of voltage undervolting, I think I'd have a hard choice picking between the two, but based on the prices I've seen, it might actually sway in AMD's side of the, the fence. I don't know. Well, what well, we're going to, that one, I don't have to make that decision. Last note. Um, you saw the uh, trademark, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, you got this Vega symbol, but there's two slashes in it, right? Just on the right side, it's two vertical slashes. And there's a lot of thoughts that this is a Vega 2 logo. And we all know that CS is just right around the corner. It's what, the 8th through the 10th or something? No, 12th. But it's in Vegas. It's actually not too far from here. But I'm not important Relatively. enough to get tickets, right? But only. AMD has a keynote on the 8th, I think it was scheduled. No, 9th. 9th at 9 to 10 a.m. So it's only an hour long. Hopefully that will be long enough. But rumor has it that they're going to be announcing the Ryzen 3000 series and a Vega GPU. And so we're thinking that this trademark that was filed right around December 1st is in preparation for launching that Vega graphics card under a Vega 2 branding at hopefully 7 nanometer, but we'll see. There's a lot of talk about the 7 nanometer range, so well, it's, yeah, it's going to be, especially even if you look at like the CES website and what it states here, just... This one sentence here kind of covers what we're looking at. AMD is catapulting computing 
gaming and visualization technologies forward with the world's first seven nanometer high performance CPUs and GPUs, providing the power required to reach technology's next horizon. Yeah, and they could be talking about their um, you know, Vega compute card and Epic CPUs for servers. I really doubt they are consuming, considering this is a consumer electronics trade show. So I, I'm willing to bet they're going to be talking Ryzen 3000 series and maybe one desktop GPU. Yeah, and the, since the next Horizon event back in November was geared more at the business side, this is going to be more for us plebs. <laughs> yeah, and based on the launch of the 2000 series and the previous 1000 series before that, we're probably looking at a March time frame for actually in-your-hand CPUs. Yeah, March to May, depending right. This is definitely only an announcement. It's not going to be any form of physical launch. We're talking paper launch. Think NVIDIA here, paper launch from NVIDIA, where the GPUs aren't going to be for another month or two kind of thing. It, that's what I see this being. And hopefully we get some more details on what Ryzen 3000 has in it, because there's been a whole lot of speculation you probably saw our previous vid where we were talking about um, the leaks for 3000. Um, we know that there almost definitely won't be an IO die separate chiplets kind of architecture like we saw with Epic on the desktop. That's most likely not going to happen. It's all but confirmed through the leaks uh, that have come after. So don't expect that. But that isn't to say that there isn't going to be some spectacular performance gains to be seen. I'm hoping at least. I'd like to see AMD bring some of those like 16 cores down to the, the desktop performance level without having some of Threadripper's drawbacks. But you never know. We will see. I'm waiting with bated breath myself because if Ryzen 3000 is a, a good platform, if it's a good CPU, I'm probably going to even pre-order one. Not just order, pre-order. If it's even, if it comes out to the you know levels that we're hearing in the uh, rumors so far, mm -hmm. it's going to be a fun year. Well, and the cool part is I got a first-gen motherboard. I'm running a X370 motherboard. And I can still buy a 3000 series CPU and drop it in my motherboard. Is it going to be the rumored 16 core Ryzen 3000 that will work in? No, it, it probably won't work in my motherboard. I might have to end up getting a, what are they going to do? X570, whatever their chipset is going to end up being called. We'll call it the X570. So be it. If I have to get a new motherboard, this one's lasted me a couple years. I can pass it down. I'm going to have a spare CPU anyway, because I actually have this great up, upgrade cycle. And this is something you don't get with a Mac. I, I'm not sure if any of you guys are fans of Macs out there, but I'm just saying one of the benefits of having PC components is I can upgrade my CPU be it with like a 12 core that can slot into my motherboard or even get a new motherboard and CPU, you know, with the 16 cores, I'm going to give my CPU to my wife who's currently on my old 1700 X. So she'll get an upgrade. And then my NAS box is running a 1600 non X. I think I'd have to double check, <laughs> but it's a Ryzen five six cores it'll get a performance boost with the 1700x that'll just drop into the, its motherboard and so that six core is just going to fall off the end there and i'll have nothing to do except for if i buy another motherboard so i might very well just end up getting a new motherboard to go with the cpu and maybe even bite the bullet and get the full 16 core that might be fun oh boy you're gonna go expensive there <laughs> yeah but I'll be able to use that uh, 1600 in my uh, uh, probably a VMware stack or something 
just get a free license for the ESX 65 or something like that. 67. You mean what I'm doing here with my 2700? Yeah, exactly. Um, probably run my firewall off of that and maybe throw in some VMs for file hosting. Might even play around with a home domain or something like that, depending on how Microsoft licensing works out for their whole professional packs of the MSDN stuff. We'll see. We'll see. Of course, I have also been considering going back to school for a few certificates, which would give me access to their educational licensing. <laughs> yeah, there's some fun things, but a lot of Microsoft stuff is 90 day trial now anyway. So there's always that as well. I love time bombs. <laughs> yeah. But I think that covers everything today, guys. Thank you for tuning in. Be sure to leave some comments. We definitely you know, like to hear from you and what you want to hear. Uh, if you have any corrections, comments, or suggestions for what you want us to cover, by all means, let us know. And thank you guys for watching. Thanks, uh, Turkano, for co-hosting. We'll see you next time. Have a good one. <laughs>